whenever you're ready. Something I've been doing recently is journaling. So I, I bought a journal from the, uh, just the local polls. Uh, and every time I feel something negative, like I get knocked out of a break, um, <laughs> you know, I, I miss a train, I have to spend an hour waiting at Redford <laughs> Station to go back to, to Wollongong, which is where I live some of the time. Um, if I go to journal, I can write down my thoughts, how I'm feeling, why I'm feeling that. I can consciously change my mental state by applying these types of techniques. And it is amazing just how like a really negative, like gloomy mindset just instantly changes. It feels so much happier, so much lighter, and so much better. The interesting thing is that is not something I was taught by like my parents or by guardians. That's something I got by like reading self-help books and going to other external sources, which are kind of like not really accessible. There's a lot of stigma around them. And it just took me years to be able to develop even like these really minor emotional control and management techniques. And that is the problem, because when your parents and when people who are instructing you and guiding you at a really young age do not tell you that you can control your emotions, you do not even try to step out of your, you know, the way you currently manage your emotions and look for techniques to possibly manage them. That is incredibly regretful in this debate, and that is why we support this policy. Firstly, in setup, this is a should debate. So we can specify the specific ways in which parents would instruct their children they can control their emotions. And I think it would necessarily be you have to not just tell children you can consciously control your emotions, but also giving them techniques to enable them to do that successfully. Could be things like teaching them about emotions and what emotions mean, like anger being a response to a perceived injustice. So if you can then reconcile whether an injustice actually did happen to you, you can then control whether or not you feel the emotional response of anger. Which is incredibly important, especially for many men, for example, which literally are given no emotional outlet and no emotional discussion at any point in their upbringing. So right, often when men feel an intense emotion like sadness, for example, they let it out as anger or violence. And that is obviously incredibly regretful. But when you're given actual guidance about different types of emotions that you can control them, that is the point which you're far more likely to express them far more, I think, appropriately. Well, things like sadness being the feeling of loss and grief, which you can often counter by focusing on how to be grateful, for example. So things like, for example, thinking through the different things in your life that you want to be grateful about, the good things that have happened to you, like the fact that you've got, like, you know, a grandmother that made you like a really nice dinner the other night. Those are the ways you can change your mindset, control your emotions, and actively fi fix the way in which you are, you are feeling. Or even just giving you techniques like meditative practices, stress relief, um, the, the instruction to relive happy memories and happy thoughts, all of those are really important. And it is impossible to teach these types of techniques if you do not also teach that emotions are something which you can consciously control. Because the alternative is that emotions aren't something which you can control. They are something that happened to you. They are something which are always legitimate. However you feel, you just let that out, as opposed to actually trying to manage them in a very healthy way. And notably, all of this, I think, should explain a few things in this debate. Number one, that this is necessary for you to be able to control your emotions in a healthy way. But also, secondly, I think I've given you a set of reasons why you can consciously control your emotions. Because at the point you can do something as simple as just like write some stuff down in a journal and change your mindset. That is consciously changing the way that you think. Secondly, though, I think obviously you would not be teaching children that you have total and complete control of your emotions. Like, you're just some sort of robot who'd be like, I am now happy. Like, it is obviously that you, you can have some level of control over your emotions. They're not just things that happen to you. That is the likely comparative in this debate. Um, thirdly, though, I think there are a set of reasons why parents would do this well. The first thing I would say is obviously parenting exists on a spectrum. Like, you've got some parents which are unfortunately, like, the brutal truth is, like, kind of absent, always at work, do the 9 to 5, like, corporate job, like, aren't going to be having as much time to instruct you. And they're probably going to be doing bad emotional instruction on probably both sides of the house. Obviously, though, that's at one end of the parenting spectrum. There's a lot of parents which, I think, obviously, have lived a life, have lots of life experiences, have managed emotions, have had, you know, relationships which have crumbled after, like, a couple of days, despite really feeling like they love that person, have had you know, people that have bullied them in school and, and you know, tried to do things like, oh, I'll just ignore the bullying and watch how that turned out. The people that have life experiences understand how to control emotions. And many of these parents will be teaching this in good ways as well. Thirdly, then, in this speech. I would say, uh, you know, this is very good in making you a better functioning and more complete human being on a number of layers. And these are the different substantive arguments we're going to give to win the debate side of the government. 
Firstly, instilling this in children at a young age, or even as they're growing up, makes them better in relationships. Because relationships crumble and fail when you are not able to control your emotions. Because at the point somebody does something which irks you, and you start arguing with them, you grow contemptuous of them, that is the point that you do not try to fix that relationship, and it fails. Secondly, I think it makes you better at school. Because school's a very isolating environment. You've just spent all this time with your parents, obviously many times feeling loved. You go to an environment where there's like lots of different kids are all interacting with you, many of them are bullying you, many of them are teasing you, many of them are better than you at academics. You're feeling you're going through puberty many more often. You're feeling all of these emotions. You need to be taught how to manage these emotions at a young age to be able to go through school and not just feel preoccupied like your crush rejected you, but actually like double down on like the ability to work on schoolwork and become a better person academically as well. Have you taken a point from closing that one? Why do people listen to sad music when they're sad? Um, they listen to sad music when they're sad because uh, sad music often provokes like endorphin responses in your head and allows you to help change your emotional state. So, <laughs> <laughs> help you deal with loss and resilience because you're going to go through a time in your life where you lose a grandparent, you lose somebody who is very close to you. You need to be able to bounce back from that. You need to be able to be told, here's how you can deal with grief in a constructive way. Or thirdly, you need to be able to deal with emotional helps like swings, like not go from feeling one extreme of emotion to another. You need the ability to be able to moderate your emotions and do things effectively. But fifthly though, I think there are some instances where you need to be able to keep things to yourself. Because you do not want to have to make other people deal with your emotional labor. Like it's really bad for maintaining a friendship. You go over to your friends constantly and you're like, hey, I'm sad about this, I'm sad about that. That person was bad to me. Like constantly over and over is how people feel emotional labor and things break down. Lastly, I think if you don't do this, it compounds because like you end up expressing your emotions in an outburst, then feeling the shame and embarrassment because like you know you're really angry at someone because you felt that anger in the moment, you did not control your emotions. Then you feel grief, then you feel inadequate, and all these other emotions come flooding into you. If you cut that off at the root, that is the point at which you know, parents teach you mechanisms to cut that off at the root. That is the point which you can go through like a far more as a far more sane, far more emotionally in control individual. That is why we propose it, OJ. I thank the Prime Minister. I now welcome the Leader of the Opposition to open the opening opposition's debate. Don't try and escape your burdens. 
firstly now, of what, uh, why this is comparatively going to be messaged better on our side. Firstly, um, you just like are now encouraging external behaviors, which are like you have conscious control over it. Thoughts are nebulous, they're difficult to understand, they're often quite speculative. Often individuals aren't in touch with their own thoughts. What is how is a parent going to observe whether or not their messaging is actually uh, going through? How can they uh, observe that this messaging is actually productive and not actually causing? unintuitively maladaptive behaviors, you just have little insight into your child's mind. Actions are visible, something that you can just like guide, you have the capacity to guide really well. But secondly, when you have something that is tangible, you have less of a capacity for really bad in implicit ideologies to infiltrate these messaging, this message that the parent is, is giving. For example, you have less of a capacity to say that boys don't cry, boys uh, ought not be sad. You have less of a capacity to uh, espouse respect of living politics on black people because you now are not saying that black people ought not be angry about these situations. You uh, have less of a capacity to perpetuate toxic positivity um, simply because when you can't control, uh, consciously control something, you have less agency and burden, uh, uh, less agency and burden on the child. This is something that we do. What does their side have? Now you have adults who overestimate the capacity of children to, con uh, uh, to control their own emotion. You have um, adults without like any scientific consensus guiding them, or without like, even if there was scientific consensus uh, access to this consensus. This is really, really bad. We ought to have productive messaging that we are stealing uh, into our children. Secondly, now on why conscious control is simply bad, and the main mechanism here is that it is difficult to do it, meaning that uh, the capacity to do so physiologically often doesn't exist. Like if I go up a flight of stairs, I, my heart rate is going to uh, increase. If I see something that is potentially triggering, I am also going to have an activation of my physiological response. It's something that is really, really difficult to control. But even if we could control things like dopaminergic seeking uh, behaviors, often this differs for lots of people. Often uh, some individuals are just like more prone to emotional responses than others. So that variety there is another reason why it's just so difficult to control and why you ought not uh, impose that burden onto a child. Note that Note that the framing here is if you don't do this, uh, if you can't control, your mind is likely to overcompensate in ways that are really bad. Subconsciously, your brain always takes a less path of least resistance. So the way in here is even if there's a small harm, the fact that it becomes entrenched at a very young age uh, leads to like, really bad maladaptive behaviors. What are these maladaptive behaviors? Firstly, whenever you feel a, a, an emotion, you immediately seek to control that emotion because um, you were told that you ought not have this emotion in the first place. It means you are likely to seek addiction-seeking things to uh, suppress this emotion in a way that is really bad. Or even if you don't do that, you might just feel a, a lot of guilt. Your parents have told you that you ought to be able to control these emotions and you physically are incapable of doing so. You feel like a failure. That is really bad. On the counterfactual, what do we have? We tell you that we are just a message, productive messaging that emotions do manifest, and instead we just encourage practices of adaption and reaction to these emotions in ways that are really productive. Um, this is super, super important because it is the only way, the best way in which you can, I guess, have uh, insight into your emotions in a way in which you can get all of the benefits OG says about, I guess, productive relationships, about um, having a fulfilling life. Before I move on, will I Sure, so we preempt this argument that it's difficult because we say it will be taught alongside emotional management techniques, which you can only teach effectively if people believe they can consciously control their emotions. But we are controlling, like, even if you consciously believe that you can control the emotions, this is just a lie if it, if it isn't actually possible. We'd rather message things that are true to children and things that are, I guess, productive to them. And, and I think on either side, children will uptake whatever their parents say to do. It's not uniquely when you have the, the, this messaging that you have the capacity control that you still have productive relationships or like a productive insight into your emotions. Emotions are like a vibrant part of the human life. But it's something that you often just can't ignore. So even on, on both sides, we will have engaged, positive engagement with our emotions. Because we tell you, we message things that are more real, realistic to children who are themselves developing and navigating the world, because we give you, I guess, more uh, better messaging to children, this is why it opens the space.
Thank you to the Leader of the Opposition. I now welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to close the opening government's case. There isn't a speech today. Firstly, on casting and secondly, on impact. The first question I want to ask in this speech is can we control emotions? And the suggestion made by this opening opposition team is that it is impossible because it is a physiological response. The first observation I would make is that it is not true that we cannot control physiological responses. And you know this because we control our physiological responses all of the time. For example, their team uses the uh, idea that when I walk up a flight of stairs, my heart starts necessarily beating a lot faster. But it does not do that to the same amount of degree if I stop being, you know, a bit of a fat slob <laughs> and instead decide to do some cardio for once in my life, right? People eat spice all the time. And despite a physiological response which tells you you should not find that pleasant and you should find that as being part particularly inflammatory, you are able to build up a tolerance for that spice. And so it's really unclear why this principle ought not equally apply to your emotions. More directly, the examples they use of things like getting over your stage fright, of dealing with things like loss and grief, etc., are clearly things that people develop as they mature into adulthood. Things like being more exposed to standing on the stage and getting past that nervousness. Things like managing your grief in a healthy way. These are all things that each of us in each and every day do naturally as we go under the passage of life. The simple change we would make under slight opening government is just to impart those constructive lessons to children far earlier in their lifetimes, in a way which is much more structured, in a way where they have the guidance of their parents to help them do so. Clearly, this is a huge benefit under our side of the house. The second claim made by the leader of the opposition is that, is that coping mechanisms actually belong to side opening opposition, but we think that this is clearly not the case, because Aaron explains to you that the important precondition before engaging in any sort of coping mechanism for emotion is to acknowledge the fact that you can engage in that coping mechanism at all. It is to say that you are able to control those modes of emotion. And it is not true that our team says, well, we're going to mechanically flip the switch that makes you happy. We explain that the way you control your emotions, the way you make yourself happy, or at least feel less of a degree of grief, is to engage in those positive, or at least like non-actively harmful practices. Which means our team is the one that says, you know, instead of being super sad all the time, maybe you do listen to some sad music, and that helps you empathize and get your emotions out, and makes you feel better, without actively expressing sadness in the moment at each and every turn. It is clear then that we at least have the capacity to control our emotions. And I guess it's the first principle push I'll make additionally in the speech. Children should probably believe true things. So if you're a parent, you should teach your child the truth. A clear slam dunk for opening government. Before I move on, I'll take opening. I think emotions and actions are different things. Do you agree? Um, yes, but that's not an explanation as to why actions cannot affect emotions, which is clearly the case, right? If I listen to a bunch of sad music, and that's not the sort of coping mechanism I personally like, that'll probably just make me sad, right? So it's really unclear that this distinction exists to the same depth opposition bench wants it to. The second push we get under their team's case, which I think is a little implicit, is just this idea that they might be able to get rid of concepts such as toxic positivity, or maybe it's an implication that our team would encourage the bottling up of emotions and a failure to spread them. But we think that's deeply unlikely for three reasons. The first is that, uh, you know, given the examples Aaron provides to you in our cell, control is not repression. We say that it is most appropriate to choose the best form with which to engage in those emotions. And that looks like, for example, if you are feeling a lot of anger because you face something unjust but it's like probably not meaningfully unjust or you weren't like actually that much affected by it, the most appropriate course of action would just to be let it go, would to be find some measure of inner peace. And we would obviously encourage kids to do that. But obviously if it was the case that you were meaningfully imposed upon and uh, acted upon in a particularly unjust way, we would encourage you to take strategic actions to address that injustice in doing so and manage your anger. And realistically for most kids, the course of action this probably looks like it's just like telling your parents. It's just like you feel particularly upset in some kind of way. And instead of going into a tantrum, you go to your parents and say, I have felt upset because of this reason. That's obviously a behavior we can model given we are the parents in this debate. We can, it is something we can encourage those children to do. 
clearly the best mode here. The second observation we would make is that insofar as you do bottle things up and that leads to outbursts in the future, that is something which probably would be socially punished if you believe their characterization about people not being able to express their emotions. Because obviously insofar as you want to closely bottle that up, that emotion does have to come out at some point, but you don't want that to happen in this world, which suggests the way you approach emotional regulation is likely to be one which, dis which avoids those forms of public outbursts, is one that encourages you to process your emotions particularly carefully on a continual basis so that outburst never occurs. But the final thing to say here is that even if we have to cop occasional outbursts, that is fine because we at least avoid the emotional, emotional burnout your friends and family get on the side opposition bench. Because when you're constantly talking about your emotions and you're constantly making a big deal about how sad or how happy or how angry you are, it mixes up the signals. Your friends and family have no sense of scale as to if something has actually meaningfully affected you or not. That's something which uniquely happens under our side of the house, where even if you do bottle it up, at the point which you contravene that norm and you make an active show of experience expressing your anger. Everyone around you knows that it is something serious, knows that it is something which has contravened this belief you've been grown up with, inoculated with, and they know it's something which requires immediate redress. Which means that our team is the one which gets far better emotional response to the vast majority of the worst instances children are likely to face. The final question to ask here is, will adults teach this well? We think it's pretty clearly true that they can, so if, only for the reason that this is a parent, so they have a spouse and are not like so emotionally toxic that they drew the spouse away at some point in their childhood's rearing. But the final thing is just that obviously most adults have experience with things like emotional regulation in their life. So this is mainly different to like teaching your kid how to do maths, for example, because you at least have the internal knowledge to engage in those processes of teaching. It's something very close to your heart it's something very intuitive that you are able to understand. And that impacts all of the material Aaron explains to you about why this is just so much better for the kids if throughout their childhood and as they grow into adulthood. It gives them a set of tools to actually meaningfully cope with their emotions instead of lashing out in really powerful ways. It makes it so that they're much more likely to deal with those negative emotions in a much healthier way, which shortens the length of time they experience them, and avoids the compounding effects we talked to you about. Most importantly, Aaron explains to you that you probably have a moral obligation to act in the Display. Because if what you care about in this debate is the emotional availability of individuals, then you ought to consider the imposition onto others' emotions such public displays of emotion have. Individuals who are not associated, but whose experiences you make meaningfully worse when you do things like soy all over the place, that is clearly something we think individuals should avoid, should practice this form of emotional regulation in a way which does meaningfully prioritize their relationships to others. The final thing to say here is that this thing claims that when individuals are physically incapable of doing so, uh, they are likely to experience some measure of guilt. We think that's fine. It is fine to encourage individuals to obey the practices as we explained to you. For all of the concrete benefits, this is clearly the most impactful the material in the debate, and I think it just will substantially outweigh every other contribution. Thank you to the Deputy Prime Minister. I now welcome the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to wrap up the opening opposition's case. consciously control your emotions the two very different things. Emotions tell you how you feel, whether you feel sad, whether you feel glad, whether you feel mad, if you say subconscious reference. But whether or not you feel certain ways and can consciously control these things, it's very different to how you react to that emotion and how you actually decide to act on that emotion. I just genuinely do not think this is a debate about emotional regulation, because I think the CAs would have said it such, and I think it is deeply imbalanced and improbable for the opposition team to have to defend the fact that parents cannot encourage emotional regulation in healthy in like emotional interaction. I think this fundamentally is just a debate about how we deal with these emotions, how we perceive these emotions, whether or not these emotions are conscious, 
controllable outcomes or whether we control the actions themselves. The POI I would have asked is whether or not Jackie can, can control his heart rate. Because I do not think he can. Do not think he can control the physiological outcomes and how he feels and how the dopamine affects his brain. I think that is where this debate occurs. Point I don't think we can screw out of this. I'll take a clarification if I don't think that's what closing. Okay, um, it's, it's point of information on clarification, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. In, in CBT, you're told that the actions you take actually do then, in turn, affect your emotional state such yep. that you, the actions you take give you some control of your emotions. Yep. That's what we support. Are you just in favour of the first bit, where you can take some actions, but the emotions don't change underneath? Yeah, so conscious control of their emotions yeah. is controlling the onset of that emotion, not the like reaction to that emotion, right? There's a different time frame here, right? Because I don't think we have to defend that like you can't go to CBT or just like CBT is not encouraged by parents or whatever, right? Or like maybe online I'm screwing this debate and I get a donut or whatever. Two contributions. <laughs> Firstly, on parental encouragement, whether this is actually feasible, whether this is difficult. Then secondly, uh, uh, I guess a new contribution, extension about addiction, about adaptive coping mechanisms. Firstly, I just want to reiterate and actually explain to you how difficult emotional regulation and the controlling of emotions, especially at the onset, actually exists. Firstly, because the concept of emotion is just likely to be suppressed and manipulated for all the structural reasons we give you. But also we would tell you that it is not actually possible for parents to actually do this in a way that is like positive or whatever. Because parents might have a positive intention to teach good things, but whether or not these are actually positively beneficial to the individual itself. Lots of people think or lots of parents think that religion is helpful for this, the kid, but often cases it has maladaptive outcomes. This is likely the conception of how parental encouragement is on their side of the house. Firstly, how is it on the impact of parental encouragement upon the kid itself, and this I think locks out our closing case you try to run some counterfactual stuff about learning emotional regulation and control of emotion through like other means. Firstly, parental encouragement fundamentally shapes the environment in which you are brought up, which is like the first 15 years or so of how you live, which is to say it guides how you interact with your child and how you conceive of the emotional outlook and how they feel emotions, but also affects them specifically by causing internalization of this idea. So if you encourage your kid that they have the capacity to control consciously control their emotion. I think it is just prima facie true that they are likely to internalize this. Because if you're encouraging this over 10 years and span over an extremely long time, period of time, I think this is something you just learn. Secondly, the specific selection of skills in emotional education that you impart on this child, I think it's relatively symmetric that we can say like, both sides can encourage emotional education on both sides of the house. I think the differentiator is the type of emotional education that occurs. On their side, I think it is the conscious conception of emotion and whether or not you feel angry when someone calls you a name. We think on our side, it's how you react to that anger, whether or not you can like call them the name back or you go to a teacher or you know tell your parent about it and stuff like that. Finally, to explain emotional development, because emotional development is extremely complicated, we just do not understand the psychology behind our child's our children's development and stuff like that. I just don't think children have the capacity to consciously alter the way that they feel emotion and the way that they engage with that. What was the counterfactual for emotional development and stuff like that? I just don't think you have the capacity to do so and to control this in the first place. But in regards to things like toxic positivity and externalization biases and stuff like that, I just think that is far more likely to occur on their side of the house. Later I'm gonna whip why this is particularly important. But I'm gonna give you five structural reasons on top of this for why it's really difficult to consciously regulate your and control your emotion. Firstly, in terms of genetic, uh, genetic differences. People are just genetically different. The way that their brain works, the way that dopamine affects their decision making and their pathways is just different. I just do not think you can standardize this across parents. I do not think this is done with this sufficient nuance. I just think a lot of adults are insufficiently emotionally regulated. It is unclear to me they are able to actually articulate this and explain this to a six year old child and tell them you have the capacity to not feel angry when someone calls you a name. You have the capacity to not feel sad. You should instead do these other things. Secondly, in terms of maturity, I just do not think they're emotionally mature enough to do this. Thirdly, in terms of social norms, I just do not think that this is a norm that occurs insofar as there's a conscious effort by parents to like, you know, be able to uh, like emotionally communicate with the children. Fourthly, in terms of preferences, individuals have different preferences. I just think it's incredibly difficult for them to like, uh, uh, like access that. Okay, second extension about long-term stuff. Why thinking that you can stop feeling sad as a reaction to certain events is probably a bad thing. The example I would give here is how addiction and how alcoholics work. The way and the reason that people drink alcohol in a lot of instances is because they want to distract themselves, is because they are unable to sit within emotion, is because they are unable to feel sad because they want to distract themselves from that sadness, from things like that. 
At the point at which you believe the fact that you can have the capacity to control and mediate your emotion and can, can consciously affect the degree of anger or the degree of sadness that you feel, I think that is far more conducive for addictive behaviours. That is to say that fundamentally it facilitates on the premise that like opt needs to propose. So probably it has some conducive nature for this. Secondly, in terms of the scoping, I think the scope of addiction is just very big. I'm not going to go into gratuitous detail, but there is just a lot of addiction. It is extremely harmful to individuals. It is something that is particularly painful and particularly difficult to overcome. I think that is facilitated under the conception of emotion and emotional capacity under their side of the house. On our side, we would say it is okay to feel sad, but the way that you deal with this sadness is to sit with it. It's not to distract yourself, but to actually engage in therapeutic practices, to learn breathing techniques, to feel the full extent of your emotion, to explore why it is that you feel this emotion, and things like that. Maybe I've just completely screwed up the opening half, maybe this is not the case, I don't know. What is the counterfactual in the comparative? Your reaction is relatively healthy, you actually learn the ways to react and you know your actions and delineations and stuff like that. Cool. I thank the deputy leader, deputy leader of the opposition. I now welcome a government member to begin the closing government's case. to go on my unhinged anti-woke boomer soy rant and finally it's happened at the right time because unlike OG who really want to frame this as just making people a little bit better against self-help I'm really looking here to solve an absolute crisis which is affecting the youth today in mental health we have record numbers of anxiety, ADHD, depression diagnoses and this is not just reporting because people feel more comfortable about it we have a 17,000% increase in hospital admissions for young girls for self-harm and a 13,000% increase for young boys Australian classrooms are now the third worst behaved in the world because of the way these kids cannot control themselves and I have to deal with this shit every day. <laughs> School refusal is at an all-time high and post-COVID many students are, are simply not recovering and also students need to be defended against this bulwark of online bullshit of these hug boxes telling these children that their feelings are valid, shading all attempts to self-help and that any attempt to get these kids to fix themselves labelling it as victim blaming. We have all of these toxic narratives that emotions are just these things which happen to you, that you need to be accept them, there isn't anything you can do about them, and that people who try to actually genuinely help, who come with a real sense of genuine compassion, are shamed out of the conversation. It's time for parents to insert themselves in that conversation early with their children and help them survive the big scary world. How would we do this? One, we're going to model it directly after CBT, which is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, or ACT, which is Acceptance Commitment Therapy. Secondly, we're going to use the online plethora of resources which already exist to counter all those we hear about how this isn't accessible. Because the reality is, like, just look over there. There's an early childhood research centre and the discovery space in UW. They educate young parents about this stuff all the time. These sessions are free. I've been to them. You can just Google CBT for kids. You'll we'll find 20 different websites. They're all cartoon. They're literally soft toy books I've read to my daughter about this stuff. There has never been a better time to go to the public library to fit, pick up one of the many, many, many pieces of advice. But also, that the type of advice we're going to give here is just so incredibly folksy and obvious if only parents knew, uh, you know, were told to do it. Like, for example, when someone gets angry, you say, I see you feeling pretty angry right now. Why don't you go for a walk? Or why don't you have a glass of water? Or let's take some deep breaths and do some other things like, let's not resolve this fight right in this moment when you're really pissed off. Let's have this conversation later. Or giving kids a language to say like, you know that thing you're feeling, it's called this. When they get a bit older, we can upgrade that to cognitive distortions. 
Seems like you're experiencing a bit of black and white thinking right now. Seems like you, like you might be mind reading the person you're in an argument with. Seems you might be discounting the positive, right? There are lots of things which I, as a teacher, do in school every day. We call it right training, it's great. But like, the resilience in our teams, it's a great acronym. But we think that parents should get in early to where they can give the children as much one on one support as possible, where they can make it bespoke to their needs, where the children are most likely to experience and open up about their day to day emotional experiences and use these as teaching moments to help them deal with conflict. Okay. Now, the only thing I'll deal with quickly with OO is that, look, I think they figured out about halfway through that they might be screwing the bank, but I'm going I'm to solve it for as best I can. The, the biggest problem here is that it's very difficult to, to teach productive ways to deal with things like unbridled anger unless you, first of all, have some control over that unbridled anger because they're like, don't hit anyone, just go for a walk. But if you really are feeling rage, then you do kind of need to control that rage in order to not make it hit someone, right? But I think the best we can do here is say that we're in favour of a narrative which talks about internal locus of control. Yes, that is my wife's psychological language. Which is to say that that emotion you're experiencing, you can acknowledge it, and then the things, the, the choices you make after it will control whether it stays with you or whether it goes away. You can feed into it, you can punch things that will encourage it to stay, you can go for a walk, you can take the breaths, you can take a lot of water, that will send it away. As in, your choices control whether you continue to experience that emotion. What they're saying at best is you have an external locus of control, which is this emotion is always happening to you, but please go tell a teacher about it and don't hit anyone. But what we say is that we need children to be more independent than that, because there's not always going to be a teacher around. There's not always going to be an adult who you can go to to help co-regulate your emotions. You need to at some point be told that you can do it by yourself, that your choices matter, and that that will help your life. On to why we the two biggest impacts we think this is going to have in the debate. The first is we think it's going to discourage children from seeking alternate sources of very unhealthy emotional management. And the second is we think it's going to improve their socialisation and success in schools. What uh, the whole debate has missed so far is that when children, and young adults and teenagers in particular, experience negative emotions, even if you tell them that's okay, everyone gets angry, everyone gets depressed, everyone gets sad, it still sucks to have them. They still want them to go away. And if they're not getting those lessons from their parents, then where are they going? They're going online, they're going to these Hubbox forums, and what they're finding there is they're finding a lot of people who are going to tell them about how self-harm isn't actually that bad, that as long as you cut at the right angle and with the right implements and then die, like sanitize afterwards that you're okay. Or they're going to go to sites which tell, which tell them that like encourage them to get into eating disorders or become fixated on the only reason you're sad is that you have to fix these things about your body and you get into people who get anxiety or so no, <clears throat> um, anorexia or bulimia as a form of managing their otherwise negative emotions. Or you get some like the guys going to like these weird incel stoicism things where like you must not experience anything emotional they are for women. You know? like, like that is where these children are going if they're not getting the advice from their parents because the advice of simply saying the emotion isn't going away and <clears throat> deal with it means that they're going to have to settle for experiencing that emotion whereas the advice we give them is to say the things you can do can actually send those intrusive thoughts away the things you can do can control those emotions is far more hopeful so they won't have the same incentive to go looking elsewhere for it last is impact on socialization and schooling Conflict resolution in schools seriously jeopardises school, um, uh, school performance and career prospects and socialisation. Why? Every single year, when we set the maths class, we get this onslaught, as every staff room does, of dozens of children who demand to change classes because they cannot be in the same room as this other person who that year seven fight has never properly been resolved. And that is just a small anecdote, but it is representative, and I noticed the recent high school graduates are laughing here because of how relevant this is. That is symbolic of how many children nowadays are simply running away from conflict rather than taking it head on and dealing with it because they don't have the tools to manage themselves in that conflict. They can't keep control over stopping disagreements from turning into arguments and fights. And what that is doing, and this is borne out in statistics, is that we're getting increasingly children who are partially true, partially truanting days to avoid classes of certain people, or turning into school refusers, a phenomenon which is at an all-time high. And these people end up without HSCs, without records of school achievement. It seriously damages their ability to get jobs and employment. But also, unfortunately, they end up being more likely to be both the victims and the perpetrators of ironically domestic violence because their ability to deal with tough interpersonal con um, uh, uh, conflicts where you can't just escape the situation becomes far, far, far greatly diminished. The only part out of this is to give these kids control of their emotions early so they can resolve conflict and be uncomfortable, but you take the right actions to make themselves better. Proud to propose.
thank the government member. I now welcome the opposition member to open the closing opposition's case. Thank you to the opposition member. I now welcome the government whip to close the closing government's case. I think there's two apparent issues with the Sierra extension about how queer youth should have their emotions validated in the process of things like undergoing gender transition or just finding their identity. The first problem is that I'm not sure the kinds of things they describe are actually emotions in the scope of the debate that we talk about. Gender dysphoria is not an emotion. Being gay is not an emotion. It is a story, it's a journey, it's an identity. And those are not necessarily things that parents from the young age would be teaching you to inhibit. But the second problem with this extension is that to the degree at which we accept maybe these things are emotions, the problem is outsized emotional responses and outbursts actually impeditive and delegitimizing of the ability of these trans kids to transition and find and, and find their identity. Because your ability and your desire to find a new identity is not seen as rational, but really rather seen as an emotional phase or an outburst. And this is particularly important in the context of a lot of countries where the process, for example, for trans kids to undergo hormonal therapy is so long because the public is very scared of the validation process. They want to make sure that you genuinely want to find a new identity. They want to make sure you're not going through a surgery that might scar you for your whole life and something that you might not necessarily want. And they find it very hard to disaggregate when instances, when you might have an instance of just a poor emotional control. You might have certain emotions that are quite outsized, that are quite outbursts in response to bad things happening in your life versus actual genuine cases of gender dysphoria. And that's the kind of thing that incentivizes the public to raise, you know, the kinds of time periods that are needed for the observation of these kids to further delegitimize what these kids are feeling because they're not feeling gender dysphoria, they're merely just feeling angry, they're merely just feeling an emotional outburst. Their extension is the kind of thing that leads to the backslide of these instances of these people's rights because the public weaponizes that this is merely an emotion, this is merely a face. Now let's move on to the most important contribution in this debate, which is the contextual oh, yeah. extension that Darren brings you at Memo. We explain that there is an undeniable mental health crisis in the status quo, and this is not just mere like more reporting as we learn about it, because we explain that the actual hospitalizations of people of self-harm are like uh, uh, have risen, but also a number of structural reasons. The fact that the rise of social media has made people more conscious, the fact that community has been annihilated in our modern conception of society means that people have far less support networks. And the problem is that opposition's case is the thing that exacerbates this, because the whole hug box culture, the validation culture that always supports, that validates your feelings and tells you that you it is okay to be angry, are the things that stop you from being able to solve these kind of problems, are the kinds of things that stop you from being able to regulate and manage your emotions and make yourself happier. We explain, therefore, the most important impact in this debate is that emotional control is the first line of defense to alleviate this crisis, because when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling angry, you are should be able to control that to some degree in an internal locus to just make yourself feel less of that bad emotion. But you also explain, in addition, this deters a set of worse alternatives from the spectrum of hard box culture that is well-meaning but does nothing to help you in the long run to all the way to like the, the incel stoicists who are just like and all that kind of stuff. But lastly, we improve outcomes for students in school, which is overwhelming the large stakeholder within this, this debate. How does this weigh over opening government? Firstly, we massively raise the imperative of this debate because the two problems with OG are firstly, like, uh, I guess it's like, uh, the first thing to say is that um, a lot of the, 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 the benefits that they talk about seem to be benefits that can be accrued into the future. So they're like, well, there's self-help and then I can, you know, when I'm Aaron Tony Aiden in 20 years, I can learn to write in a journal. And yes, like they get the benefit of you get this a bit earlier. We explain that the problem is that there is a mental health process happening in youth in schools at the moment, which is why the intervention has to happen at this point. And we corollary also raise the impact of all our benefits because we don't just make someone manage their emotions better in dealing with day-to-day -day, uh, crises like I've missed the train, but rather dealing with real instances of anxiety and oppression that are really harmful for these young people. The second thing that we uh, introduced that makes us take over OG is that the problem with OG's uh, kind of world is that the assumption is kind of like, well, uh, people organically develop coping mechanisms over time as they grow older, and this basically accelerates that process. But we explain that because we live in a world where there's a number of countervailing uh, factors that actually 
actually inhibit your ability to do emotional control because there's a hard box hug box culture of telling you that your emotions are valid because everyone in society is trying to validate things like your anorexia or things like your gender dysphoria for example those are the kinds of things that set this all back which means that you don't organically get these kind of changes if you do nothing that is why we explain you must have parental supervision because without parental supervision to counterbalance that the counter the overwhelming forces of society are the things that set you back against the trend of emotional management how does this deal then with opening opposition Opening opposite, actually before this, uh, closing, you have a PY? Yeah, is love an emotion? Um, so, I would say love po possibly is an emotion, <laughs> uh, yeah? Like, I, I guess it's an emotion in the psychological sense that Isaac describes it in the pedagogy, which is like, mad, glad, sad, I don't think love rhymes. But the second problem <laughs> uh, is that, uh, as Jackie explains helpfully in a POI, this is not an emotion that will be told by parents to be inhibiting of children. Like, this is obviously about unproductive emotions in society, it is fine if everyone loves a bit more. If then your problem is like, well not that all parents are good and some parents are like homophobic and therefore they might do this badly. The problem is, the problem is that those parents are homophobic. That's the first problem we have to deal with before the point of whether they recognize this emotion is good or not. Lastly, how does our extension deal with opening opposition? They explain that the control of emotion leads to things like tone policing, and it's preferable to validate these emotions. But we explain that the very validation of these emotions is a bad thing. They provide short-term hedonistic support. Because maybe you join a Reddit community that says your feelings are valid and you know everything is okay, and they provide you for hug box the hard box culture but at the end of the day you have to go back to the cold real hard world and you can't live on Reddit forever in the real world people are racist to you people are horrible to you and you need to find a way to get yourself out of that situation and the fact that these people have further validated your feelings takes away your sense of control and autonomy you no longer believe you have an ability to stop this because for example if you're involved in like a uh, race to, uh, racist based forums. They just tell you there's nothing that you can do because capitalism and white oppression means that you're hopeless within this life. We give people that sense of agency when we tell them that you can control this and empirically they can control this to some degree. Secondly, they say this is hard to control. Firstly, there is obviously nuance in this. We don't have to support parents telling kids you can totally control your emotions. Secondly, our extension provides the salient methods of how you do this because Hewitt has a lot of spec knowledge and says things like CBT and like all the emotional management techniques that OG don't and that is a valid contribution. But lastly, uh, we explain that in the, uh, the counterfactual, people find other ways to deal with this that are far, far worse. They say, well, there's a difference between feeling control versus action control, and we can support deal with action control. We explain that feeling control is a prerequisite for action control, but secondly, even if this is true, this affects OG, but not us, because we're talking about mental health, which isn't reliant on actual responses. Lastly, in terms of alcohol, I think people turn to alcohol when they feel like they have no sense of control, which puts this claim, for these reasons, very proud to propose. <laughs> I thank the government whip. I now welcome the opposition whip to close the debate.